you must have watched The Final Destination. And the story we're telling today is a real-life Final Destination story, where one person foresaw the death of her fellow band members and friends, and warned them not to board the plane. Yet, they didn't listen. Let's look inside the disaster that took six lives, including leader Ronnie Van Zantz, and cut the Southern rock legend's career short. The original core of Leonard Skinner, Ronnie Van Zant, Bob Burns, Gary Rossington, Alan Collins, and Larry Junstrom formed the band My Backyard in 1964 as teens in Jacksonville, Florida. Under that and other names, the band honed its skills performing local and regional gigs during the 1960s and early 1970s, before breaking out nationally in 1973 after adopting the name Leonard Skinnerd in honor of a high school gym teacher slash nemesis named Leonard Skinner. The newly renamed band scored a massive hit with their hard-driving debut album, 1973, which featured Freebird, one of the most well-known and jokingly referenced rock anthems of all time. Second Helping, 1974, their follow-up album, featured the even larger hit Sweet Home Alabama, which solidified the band's place as giants of the southern rock subgenre. Leonard Skinner performed in the Greenville Memorial Auditorium in Greenville, South Carolina on October 19, 1977, two days after the release of their album Street Survivors. The next day, they boarded a faulty Convair CV-240 plane bound for Baton Rouge, Louisiana to perform at Louisiana State University. The jet crashed over the swamp, while pilots attempted an emergency landing at a local airport in Gillsburg, Mississippi, due to a defective engine that was losing fuel at an excessive pace. The plane was in a free fall at 4,500 feet, and McCreary made the chilling announcement to his passengers, We're out of gas. Put your heads between your legs and buckle up tight. Pilot Ronnie Pyle, who had been killed in an airplane crash, was in the cockpit when the problems began. He saw death in Van Zandt's eyes and was shocked by the news. Some people cursed the plane, while most were lost in thought as the plane began its 10-minute death glide to the ground. Van Zandt spent his last minutes alive, with someone rousing him from his slumber in the airplane aisle and strapping him in a seat, while others sat down and prayed for his life. Attempts to maneuver a soft landing in a field or stretch of highway proved fruitless as the craft sank lower and lower into the remote forest near the Mississippi-Louisiana border. The trees kept getting closer and bigger, and a sound like someone hitting the outside of the plane with hundreds of baseball bats caused the plane to sink lower and lower into the forest. The Convair tore a 500-foot swath through the thick timber, but the metal body couldn't withstand the 90-mile-an-hour impact of the sturdy pines, which sheared off wings and tore open the fuselage. The cockpit and tail were ripped away, and the remaining cabin buckled into an L-shaped tangle of wreckage as it skidded to a stop in the mangrove just after 6.53 p.m. local time. Van Zant died instantly of blunt force trauma to the head. Dean Kilpatrick and Steve Gaines were killed on impact, while Cassie lived a short time longer before succumbing to blood loss. The lifeless bodies of pilots McCreary and Gray remained strapped in the cockpit seats, which were now suspended upside down from a nearby tree. Witnesses recall lead vocalist Ronnie Van Zant sleeping on the floor with a pillow early on the trip, having been awake most of the night and in need of sleep. Several other passengers entertained themselves by playing cards. At some point, the passengers realized something was wrong a drummer Artemis Pyle recounts entering the flight deck and being instructed to go back and strap himself in by the scared captain, Walter McCreary. The passengers sat in silence, some praying as the gravity of the situation became obvious. As the jet began hitting trees, guitarist Gary Rosington heard what sounded like hundreds of baseball bats pounding the fuselage. The roar became increasingly louder until Rosington was struck unconscious. He awoke on the ground some minutes later, with the plane's door on top of him. Billy Pal's nose was nearly torn off from his face in the incident, and he sustained severe face lacerations as well as significant lacerations to his right leg. 
Decades later, in a VH1 Behind the Music special, he recounted the flight's final moments, claiming that Van Zandt, who was not wearing a seatbelt, was pushed violently from his seat and died instantly when a skull hit a tree as the plane broke apart. Some aspects of Powell's testimony have been challenged by both drummer Pyle and Van Zandt's widow, Junie Van Zandt Ginnis, who posted the autopsy findings on the band's website in early 1998 while verifying others. Pyle sustained broken ribs but was able to leave the scene to notify a nearby resident. The crash killed Van Zandt, guitarist singer Steve Gaines, backup vocalist Cassie Gaines, Steve's sister, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, Captain McKeary, and first officer William John Gray. The majority of the survivors were sitting near the back of the plane. The survivors, all of whom were critically injured, were transferred to different hospitals for treatment and were unaware of the fatalities until they arrived. Rosington, for example, was not informed of Van Zandt's death until days later by his mother in the hospital. Cassie Gaines was so afraid of traveling in the conveyor that she would rather ride in the band's tiny equipment van, but Van Zandt persuaded her to board the plane on October 20th. Jojo Billingsley, another member of the band's trio of backup singers, dubbed the Honkettes, was not on the plane because she was under the care of a doctor in Senatobia, Mississippi, coping with health issues caused by substance abuse. Billingsley was expected to rejoin the tour on October 23rd in Little Rock, Arkansas. She described having nightmares about the plane disaster and pleading with guitarist and founding member Alan Collins over the phone not to continue using the conveyor. Ed King, the band's ex-guitarist, subsequently stated that he always knew it wasn't going to end well for the band, owing to their tendency for drinking and brawling, but he never imagined it ending the way that it did and recalled being struck with sadness upon learning of the accident. Rescuers had to cross a 20-foot wide, waist-deep creek and dig through an overgrown forest to free rescue vehicles that had become trapped in the muck. Locals assisted rescue personnel in transporting victims to hospitals on the backs of pickup trucks. It was later discovered that the plane, which appeared to be belonging to the Clampett family, was rejected due to concerns about the plane and crew standards. The band had planned to acquire a Learjet after arriving in Baton Rouge to replace the 30-year-old plane, which was considered outdated by the band's circle. A band leader who knew he was going to die. Band members scared for their dear lives as the flight descended into a death trap. What's it like to watch violence like that and live a normal life afterward? Can you ever go back to being a normal person and living a regular life and not constantly recall the tragedy that you suffered from?